This meeting will now come to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Binsbacher. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Councilmember Patena. Here. Councilmember Finn. Here. Councilmember Edwards. Here. Councilmember Leone. <coughs> Here. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council special meeting of January 17th, 2019. We have one item on our study session agenda this evening, and it is the 2018-2019 Development Impact Fee Study. And with that, I will turn it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne to begin. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. And as you're aware, in the upcoming months, we are developing our Capital Improvement Program, which focuses on many of the large, significant infrastructure and facilities that we have in the city and planning for them in the future. Uh, one of the major revenue sources for that program is what is termed <coughs> development impact fees. It's a way for uh, the cost of new development to be shared amongst those specific new development coming in. Uh, we're going to have someone here, an expert, to explain that to us. We have with us Deputy City Manager Katie Gregory to go into the development impact fee process and the current status and even some history on it. Thank you. All right. Somewhere it'll come up. Huh. All right, I'll, I'll just get started. I just, tonight, um, I wanted to provide just a brief update on where we are with our development impact fee study. We are currently um, in our uh, draft review time, so that means that we're required to put a draft out to the public and allow them to review it. So we've had been working the last 18 months on, on the update. We've had two firms um, that have been working with us. First one is Reftelis which uh, you may have heard of them. They've worked with us on our water rates and some of our other infrastructure financing related to our utilities. Um, and they do consulting and finance and rates um, specifically um, in a lot of areas, but most specifically for us in water and wastewater. Duncan Associates is the other group that we're working with, Clancy Mullen, and they specialize in urban planning, rate studies, and special studies um, more on the planning side. So both firms have been working with us um, and they've been updating the study for us over the past 18 months, working with staff, getting inputs, um, and really um, developing our, our study and our fee recommendations. So I will give you a little bit of history. I promise there was one slide on this, but since uh, it's not up there, I'll just talk about it a little bit. If you recall, I won't go all the way back, but in 2011, that was the big year for impact fees in Arizona in our more recent history. That was when um, Senate Bill 1525 um, went through, and that was when the um, impact fee statute changed pretty significantly. Um, in 2012, uh, we had to stop issuing, or we had to stop um, um, receiving certain impact fees related to our general government fee, which helped fund a lot of our public facilities that we needed for growth, our open space and our trail fees. We also had to make a lot of changes um, to what we were authorized to uh, include in our cost estimates for some of our normal fees that we continue to have, such as parks, transportation, some of these other, um, other fees. So um, in 2014, we did update in, to be in full compliance with Senate Bill 1525, um, and that was kind of a big overhaul of our impact fees and kind of a whole, a whole new look. One of the outcomes of that legislation was that it changed a little bit in the way, A, the methodology we can use for the types of fees that we have, which fees we can assess for, how much of those fees we can assess for. As an example, we can only assess for 3,000 square foot of a recreation center. So when you look at our Rio Vista and you see 52,000 square foot recreation center in the future, if we want to build that for, for new residents that have come into the city, we can only assess fees to up to 3,000 square feet. So that means the rest of the funding for that will have to come from other residents in the community. Um, so there are a number of things that kind of came out of that. So we updated all of our fees, um, and then we are required by the statute to come back every five years at a minimum and update the fees again. So that's where we are right now. We're updating the fees. This is the first five-year cycle after the new statute went into effect. So I just want to talk real quickly. This is like the basic um, kind of process for impact fees. Really three major components are what make up our impact fees. The first one is our land use assumptions. These are important growth projections that we have. So we look each year um, and every 10 year, when we look at 10 years out, 
Um, we try to make some assumptions about what kind of growth are we going to see? Where are we going to see it in the city? Is it going to be residential? Is it going to be non-residential? If it's non-residential, what type of non-residential is it going to be? Is it going to be commercial? Is it going to be industrial? Are they going to be public institutions like schools and churches and things like that? Um, hotels, motels, all of those are, those are important inputs for us to have into the, um, into the study. And we try to come up with some sort of consensus. So we work with our stakeholders to say, hey, you know as developers kind of what your plans are, and we know as city uh, folks about kind of how long it takes to kind of make those plans come true. Um, we also know what our land use is and what those entitlements are, um, and we have the ability to kind of mesh all of that together and kind of come up with, with what we think is a reasonable, um, not too out, you know, not too high hopes, but also not too conservative, kind of what's, kind of what do we really think is going to happen over the next 10 years? And we do that by being very Peoria specific. So we look su subdivision by subdivision, parts of the city by parts of the city, um, what's happening in all those areas and what do we know about those areas? So that's the first piece, is our land use assumptions, and that's a very important piece. The second piece is our capital needs. What are we going to need to serve those people that are coming into those different areas of the cities? city? So it's not just what's in our CIP today, because that's the stuff that we do and that we plan on doing. But developers are also coming into the city, and they're going to have to put some infrastructure in. And we want to make sure that our CIP for impact fees, which is called an infrastructure improvement plan, includes those items that the developer is bringing in as well. Because ultimately those developers either A, will put it in and dedicate it and get a credit against their fees, because we don't want to charge them twice for the same thing, or B, give us a fee and then we have to go out and build it. So we want to make sure that we have the ability to do one, one of those things. Um, they are for development related projects only, so impact fees cannot cover replacements or rehabs of ex existing facilities. Um, so all of that kind of goes out. Um, that's not part of what the impact fee can pay for. And we focus in Peoria, part of our policy discussion on this is that we focus a lot of our, um, all of our impact fees really on regional type of improvements. So we ask developers, if you're building a subdivision, those interior streets, those interior water lines, all of that, that's part of your cost to develop in the city. But those arterials, those major water distribution lines, those major collection lines, those are the kinds of things that, that um, we, at, we, we include in the fee when we do the fee calculations. And another major component is the service area. So we look around and we say, what makes sense? Part of the statute requires that if you collect a development fee from um, a developer or from for a subdivision or for a part of the city, that they also benefit that from the improvements that those fees are going to pay for. So you have to kind of create what they call a nexus in that. So we create that nexus in a rational basis for what we're, what we're charging. So they get the benefit of whatever they pay. And we also want to make sure that we do that based on natural boundaries because we found from lessons learned that sometimes if you don't draw the lines right, it gets very confusing. You might cross a subdivision and one house on one side of the street pays one fee and a house on the other side of the street pays another. And we really don't want to see those things happen. So we try to focus on those major natural boundaries or, or major barriers, major arterials, things like that to kind of create um, where those service areas are. So I want to talk a little bit about our stakeholder group. Um, we've always got a history in Peoria of trying to involve our state stakeholders, particularly on the impact fee um, updates, because it's important for us to learn as much as we can from them as we're also providing them information about the city. So we work with all of our real estate developers in the city, and that can be in the form of major master plan developers that are out there that are looking, that are in the process of, of entitling projects. We look to work with our home builders who are out there. So once those projects are entitled and they're moving forward through the process and parcels are being sold off to home builders, they've got a vested interest in what the fees are going to be, and they want the ability to um, weigh in on some of that as well. We work with the Arizona State Land Department because, as you know, a lot of our land in the north part of the city where, our growing, where we're growing the most is uh, part of state land. Um, we work with the Home Builders Association and the Multifamily Association because they are the advocates and, the, and they are the ones who speak the loudest typically for a lot of the, the consortium of home builders and the consortium of multifamily builders. Um, so we try to cultivate good relationships with all of these folks because we know uh, they have opinions about what's happening in Peoria and they certainly have opinions about ultimately what it's going to cost for them to develop in Peoria. 
So what we go through with them is our growth projections. Hey, are we getting this right? Do you guys see anything with this that um, makes you scratch your head? Are we, are we way out of bounds or are we kind of reasonable? Um, we talk about our infrastructure plans. What are we planning to put in our IIP? Are, is your project in the IIP? If it's not in the IIP, should it be in the IIP? Let's all make sure that those things um, are, are inclusive. Um, we talk about the service areas, our rationale for why we're creating the service areas, and I'll go through those in a minute, um, why we have the t different types of service areas we have. We talk about our fee methodology, and I just want to take a quick moment on here. Um, you know, that is one that um, is, is usually, uh, there's multiple ways in which you can go about developing an impact fee. Um, we try to be um, consistent across years so that developers, when they come to Peoria, if they've worked in Peoria 10 years ago and they come back, they're not seeing something too totally different. They're not having to re-educate themselves about how we do things in Peoria. Um, so we try to keep those consistent, um, and I'll go through a little bit of those in a minute. And then we also want to hear from them, what are your concerns? What are the things that you're hearing? And you know, we get the gamut. We get things about that have nothing to do with impact fees when we're talking with our, our developers, but we also, um, they also are you know, getting really good, this group of developers and, and, and home builders and folks, these stakeholders that we have are getting really good at understanding kind of how we go through impact fees. We've had enough conversations with them. So they'll give us some current concerns or things like that. And in fact, this last week we had a stakeholder meeting um, specifically on the water and wastewater side, and we did hear a concern, and it is going to have, we are going to go back and look at some of that and see, and that's exactly why we have those meetings, is to, is to hear what they're concerned about or see if there's something else that maybe we missed that, that we want to hear about. I want to just give you a quick um, overview of what we're using as some of our assumptions for growth projections. So you can see in here, uh, these are the new dwelling units, and this is basically what we're using. It's a little different on, this is for the non-utility fees. On the, on the utility fees, it's a little different because we have different water service areas in the city where we're not collecting impact fees from them. So um, in, in that one, it may be slightly less. But if you look here, this makes sense. We've got about 17,000 units kind of projected over the next 10 years. Um, it's actually 11, but we'll, you know, because we started in 2017. But um, for the next 10 years, and uh, that's about 16 to 1,700 units a year is basically what we're projecting. That's pretty on par with what we're seeing right now. Now, things could change, and that's one of the considerations we always want to make, is that we think that if we stayed pretty pretty on par with what we think is going to come in and, how, and the pace at which it's coming in, we think this is a pretty reasonable. And you can see that in the southern part of the city, we expect a lot less than we do in the northern. That's our growth area, and it makes some sense. When you look at the non-residential side, you see kind of a little bit of a different picture. Um, we do see some good, strong um, square footage going in the northern portion of the city, primarily in that northwest area where we have the Vistancia Commercial Core. But we also see a lot of it happening in the southern part of the city. And when you think through that, that makes sense as well. The more developed part of the city, where we have opportunities to bring in industry and, and, and other um, types of development on the non-residential side, you know, they're, they're going to be looking at areas where the infrastructure already exists and they have a much easier um, way to, you know, much, much less costly way to get in. So um, you'll see some of that. So, you know, I, I shared this mostly just to kind of give you a sense of one of the assumptions that we're using in our study. Any questions about that? Sure. The 3.01 is basically 3 million square feet of, of commercial, non-residential space. When I say commercial, it could be a number of things. It could be schools, it could be hospitals, it could be you know, retail, it could be industrial. But the idea is that over the next 10 years, about 3 million square feet of, of space, commercial space is going to be developed, new space is going to be developed in the southern part of the city. Yes, yes, that, and part of that's because. But the Northwest obviously is going to have more homes. Right. So they won't have as much space for the industrial. Right. Okay, that makes sense. So that's a much more residential intensive part of the city. Um, it does, it will have some commercial up there. Um, you can see in the middle part of the city, some of that's because a lot of it's already been built. You know, we've got a lot of um, commercial and industrial and um, other non-residential uses in that area. Just real quickly on the methodology, um, why this is important is just to kind of, you're never going to remember this, so don't, don't try to remember it, but, <laughs> but just to kind of give you a sense, I'm going to give you the bigger concept here. On our non-utility fees, so on our transportation, parks, police, and fire fees, we use what's called the standard base, standards-based approach. 
it is a little bit more conservative. It is one of the more conservative methodologies. And what that means is that we basically, the, the, what, what we put in the IIP for cost isn't, is, is there as a guide, but it's not necessarily used to determine the fee. Now that seems counterintuitive, right? We have all these costs over here, we have all these people, why don't you just take a numerator and a denominator, do the math and come up with a number? That's not the way that it works. Every different type of development has different um, traffic patterns that they require, um, impacts on our roadways, impacts on our parks, impacts on our um, police and fire. And the existing development is used for, we take basically our existing development that's in the city and we come up with what's that standard that we already have in the city and how do we project that out? So mm -hmm. when we do that, we're looking at what is all the stuff that we've already put in, what's the standard so that when you hear about level of service, right? What's the current level of service and if we wanted to provide a similar level of service going forward, what would the cost of that be based on what we've already done? That's what a standards-based approach does, okay? So the important piece of that is to say that that doesn't, it's not what drives the fee. The cost of the new improvements is not what drives the fee. What we've already done and the standard that we've already set is what really drives the fee. Does that make sense? Okay, I have a question about All right. that. <laughs> so the methodology, the methodology is standards based and yet our previous standards were based on, on more revenue and so to build the second half of our city with right. less revenue from Im impact fees, how are you saying that those standards right. mesh? So that's a really good question, and it's always been the struggle, right, is how do you ensure that you're generating enough cash flow and revenue in order to pay for the improvements that you want to make that are going to serve growth? Right. right, that's that's the whole whole point of this, and in men, and with a standards based approach, you're basically saying, and the, and the law requires this that you don't charge a higher level of service than what already exists. So if we as a city say we want a higher level, or not even a higher level of service, when we go out and want to build more in the northern part of our city. Maybe it's going to cost more. Maybe it's, you know, because they're going to cost more than what already exists today. But we're going to only be able to charge for what exists today. Now, in our city, we've done a pretty good job about, let's, I'll use parks as an example because I think that's a really good one. We have a southern community park, we have sort of a central community park, and we're in the process of building a northern community park. Parts of that northern community park can absolutely be funded with impact fees. The challenge we have now with the new statute is that only up to 30 acres can be ap applicable to impact fees. That's where we start running into problems, meaning growth isn't fully paying for growth. In the past, we've been able to charge for, you know, the 50 plus acres of, of um, community park, but in, in the few, since 2014, we can only charge for up to 30 acres on a community park. Which is counter to standards-based approach. Right, well, it, it, it means that we can count up to those 30 acres in our standard. So, it means that we have to basically say our standard has to be at the lowest denominator versus trying to push it up higher. Or our standards have to be reduced unless we cover the rest of that with... Right. With other sources of funding for the city, fund. which we are, and which we do. And, and so that's a perfect example. Paloma Park will be a perfect example of blending the two. It's going to be funded with existing sources or, or sources that are generated from existing residents, right? Geo bonds. It's also going to have sources from our development impact fees. And I think it's very fair that we say growth does not pay for itself any longer in Arizona. I think that we are much more in that. We're much more going that direction than we are the other direction in, in Arizona, based on the new statute. Yes, Council Member Finn. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the 3,000 square feet and then the, thir the um, 30, 30 acres. acres. Mm -hmm. Is that per site? How does that? How yeah, does, so okay. that would be, that would be, you can build more, but you have to pay for it with other sources, right? Or you have to find other sources to do it. So, yes, so if we're building a new rec center somewhere, 3,000 square feet is our limitation for what we can charge impact fees for. Okay, so just so that I understand it, this is my, the way my head works. So could I, if I did a 60-acre park, I could charge impact fees for 30 and have to, what if I built two 30-acre parks? 
Come on, if you know you you're all thinking. If you can show the clear boundary, <laughs> sure. I mean, you, we could try it. I don't know if we want to be the poster child for that, but we I shouldn't have said that out loud. <laughs> I know. Okay. All <laughs> I right. can tell you that it probably wouldn't be recommended, and I think that, that that's not in the okay. spirit of what the statute um, Please strike intended. my question from the record. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> Now, a little bit conversely on the, on the utility fees, we use what's called a hybrid approach. This is a pretty normal approach for utilities, and the reason for that is because very often utilities have to go in well before development occurs, right? You can't even hook a home up to uh, or, you know, do anything until you have the, the water and wastewater infrastructure in place. So we use a hybrid approach that considers both the capacity of what we've already built at a point in time when you're doing a study with future capacity that's gonna be built with new projects. So you blend those, there's a weighted unit average cost that we use um, for that so that that's how the fee is then, then pushed in. And, and there's a number of complexities to it, and I won't get into that, but all you have to remember is that we're all, we're paying the, the impact fee covers both what we have in capacity and what we're hoped to have in capacity once we build those projects. Okay, so they're paying for both. Okay, and so I have a question about that. That is that is um, the IIP yes. assumptions. Mm -hmm. Okay, and those are those are assumed over a 10 year period of time, is that yes. correct? We have up to 15 years with water and wastewater, just oh. so you're aware. We try to like focus on 11 to 12 years just to be more on the safe side. Okay, and that information is, is gleaned from our stakeholder meetings, so, which is basically developers who are projecting future developments in our city. Right. All right, um, and so, and then we go back every five years. Yes. And double check all of those? Yep, is we go back every five years, A, because we're required, but also because it makes some sense. Um, you know, a lot can happen over five years, and we want to verify that we're still on the same pace. We may find that, in, for example, in our last study, we thought Saddleback Heights would probably be coming in, you know, starting probably in the next year or so. That's probably more than five years off at this point. Um, so sometimes your assumptions are off, and you need to make sure that you're updating those assumptions as you go forward. Okay. Um, and. One more question, if you could tell me about the service areas again. Yes, I'm going to go through oh, okay. each of the service areas for each of the um, fees. So All right. maybe All that'll right. answer your question. We'll kind of go into that. So we'll start with transportation. Um, and I'm trying to provide everything kind of here and, and on one slide, but basically with transfer transportation, we have, we focus on major arterials, parkways, you know, those kinds of roadways within our next 10 year time frame. So engineering does kind of their, their work and they say, hey, what do we think is gonna happen? Based on what we know about development and those projects that are coming in and the projects that we know we have to do, what is that going to be? Those are your, your Lake Pleasant Parkways, your Happy Valley Roadways, your major arterials within your um, growth areas in northern, northern Peoria. And then we recommend that we're going to do two zones north of Deer Valley. So we have a central zone, which is basically, because the south zone does not have an impact fee. Let me just start there. The south zone doesn't have one. Those arterials, those major roadways in, are in place. Any new roadway improvements we have to do in the southern part of the city, quite honestly, is not being driven by growth that's occurring in the city. It's by growth that's occurring outside of the city and requiring us to do some expansions on some roadways. So in the central part of the city, between Deer Valley Road and north up to SR 74, but east of the Agua Fria, those are, we have projects in that area, and then we, we took the Agua Fria west and those are the, net, the that's the, the north zone. So those are the zones that we're um, proposing, and the fees are changing slightly. Interestingly, in the case of the north zone, fee, the fee is actually going down a little bit. This is driven primarily from a change in some of the ITE data. So for those of you that I know are all traffic engineers here, <laughs> ITE data <laughs> is basically trip data. And it, there's, a, there's, there's definitely fewer trips, and I don't know if it's the Amazon effect or what it is, but there's definitely fewer trips that are being generated for different types of land uses, and that's been a trend that they've been seeing. So uh, it's, and it's also that some of the projects are done, you know, there's, there's, there's not as much necessarily, maybe not as much capacity required because we've built some roadways, we've expanded some roadways, so we're not having as many through lanes um, in our IIP potentially. But a lot of it's being driven by ITE data. So it's going down slightly. Um, and then in the central zone, it's, it's going up slightly. So it's kind of, but, but that makes some sense. Um, you can see, I think I put on here too, you can see the cost of projects in each of those zones. So right now we have, and again, I mentioned that 
the, the IIP isn't what drives the fee, but it is the guideline, it's the guidepost for us when we're looking at what, what some of the um, projects are going to be. So $212 million um, planned in the north zone and $85 million planned in the central zone for projects. The next one is public safety. This is a citywide fee. It's always been a citywide fee. Um, sometimes we hear from um, our Home Builders Association that they think it, we should use some different methodology. We feel very strongly because we have that integrated system um, for emergency response um, that we don't want it. We don't want this fee to be separated. Um, we are looking to increase the police fee slightly, um, and the fire fee is going up a little more. And a lot of that's driven. We have more uh, more requirements for our police and our for, excuse me for our fire facilities. We tend to build more fire stations than we do police stations. When we build a police station, we build a big one police station like we did up at Pinnacle Peak. Fire stations are more dispersed throughout the city. So. On our parks, you can see here that what we're looking we are proposing one change with our um, service area. So right now, the service area for Zone One and parks is from. Bell Road north to, to uh, Pinnacle Peak, we're proposing to move that one mile up to Happy Valley Road. Um, so that was not only um, because it makes a little bit more sense geographically, but also because um, we had had some agreements with a with a developer that we would do that in the next update. Um, I don't know if it's you know going to help too much for that particular developer, but um, it made sense that that those homes that were being built um, between. Pinnacle Peak and Happy Valley, which, as many of you know, a lot of that's county, um, so we don't collect impact fees from there. So it made Happy Valley kind of a more um, appropriate um, um, line for us to draw from. So we're looking to adjust that one, and then um, we don't have any growth projects. When I say growth projects, it doesn't mean there aren't park projects south of Bell Road, but it does, or park improvement projects, but it does mean that none of those are being driven by new growth that's occurring in those areas. And then. Um, this is an interesting category because it also is one that historically never required a non-residential parks fee, but as of the new statute, we have to have a non-residential parks fee, which gets a little bit, you know, is strange, I, you know, but you're basically taking those employees that are working in those non-residential uses potentially would be using our parks, so therefore we, we're, we're to charge a fee. It's statutory, so I don't know that it necessarily makes sense, but. Um, Wait, I'm sorry, so in the past we did not charge commercial <laughs> development for parks fees, and right. now we can As charge them, but it's a discounted fee? Yeah, so it's a very small fee per thousand square foot, um, but it is a fee that we're required to charge, yes, so. Uh, so you can see kind of where the fees are going to go um, or are being proposed to go um, for single family residential, slightly up um, in, in the two, one and two, and then um, about the same for zone three. Oh, and there was the, the dollar values, the 14.4, 34.7. In 34.7, again, um, Paloma Park is in that one. On the water side, we'll talk real quickly about water. One proposed change in our um, water service areas, we had in the 2014 study, we had north and south. We basically said north of Bell Road and south of Bell Road because we only had the, um, we had the south zone being fed by Greenway Water Treatment Facility. We had the north zone being fed by Pyramid Peak. And then west of the Agrafria, we're looking to carve that out and it create a secondary or another zone. A lot of that has to do with in that part of the city, we have CFDs, um, and we have a lot of different type of ways that development is going in in, in those, those areas of the city. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the fees. The fees are going up, but in the northwest part of the city, um, they look like they're going up a lot. I need to just let you know that those also, there's a number of credits that are going to be assigned to all those developments there as well because they put in a good number of pieces of infrastructure. So they will receive credit off of that fee um, and bring that down fairly significantly. Um, but if you're a new developer going in there and you aren't part of any of those major master plan developments that are putting in some of those major master um, pieces of infrastructure, um, the, the fee is the $5,700. So you can kind of just see there, um, oops, get those in there, um, what we're planning on doing for that. Any questions? Which will actually guide the kind of development that goes in there. Yes, it will, yeah. 
So that that's is. one of our changes. Oops, sorry, is that zone? Oops, did you have a question? Apartment buildings. Uh, multifamily is assessed at a slightly so typically the um, single family residential fee is kind of your standard EDU fee. And I'm talking about the non utility side first. The single family residential is your standard, and that's typically based on a person's per household. In our case, I want to say, I don't have it right in front of me, but I think it's like 2.93 people per household. Since apartments tend to have less persons per household, their fee is then, um, there's a, a, the ratio is more like 1.97. So if a single family is considered one, then a uh, multifamily would be like 0.87 or something like that. So they pay like 87% of the fee. Okay, now on the water side, water and, and wastewater is assessed based on the meter size required for the development that's coming in. So a single family unit uses either a three quarter inch or a one inch meter. In our case, we charge the same fee for a three quarter or one inch for residential. At an apartment complex, you might need a one and a half inch to serve eight units, or you might need a two inch to serve, you know, 10 or 12 units. So they'll pay, and it's the same kind of ratio. A, a three quarter inch meter is like just call that one and then for every increase in size there's a ratio that's as attached to that so you pay slightly more does that make sense okay and then for wastewater um, we do have uh, two zones this hasn't changed this is staying the same east and west of the Agua Fria again east of the Agua Fria is served by Beardsley and Butler West of the Agua Fria is served by Joe Max. Again, credits will be issued for those developments on the west of the Agua Fria that have put in significant infrastructure associated with that. Um, so we definitely will be seeing those fees um, less for those who have, have um, contributed infrastructure. And then there it is, 67 million and 59 million. Excuse me, Katie. Oops, yes. Vice Sorry. Mayor. Okay, you, <laughs> I'll give you the big picture because everyone, every, every development is a little bit different. So basically what it is is that if they, if they put in the infrastructure and dedicate it to the city and it becomes part of our city asset classes, right, so we have all these assets from the city, then they are eligible to receive a credit against the impact fee. So if it's in the IIP or if it was in the case of water and wastewater, if it was part of something that is part of that available capacity. Perfect example, Vistancia built a good portion of Joe Mack's right. um, reclamation facility, right? So they have credit for what they've built. They've basically taken care of their needs for the residents in that area. Um, so they wouldn't be paying the full fee because they'll need to, they get credit for what they've already built. That's how it works. And every different piece, they've built wells, they've built the part of the reclamation facility, they've put in water lines and oversized them for future development those types of things, so they get credit for all of those. And we, it's, it's a lot, but it's an administrative kind of, you know, <laughs> um, we, have to, we have to keep track of those things, we work with them, we kind of go through um, what that will be and how that will look going forward. So Katie, so. Just, just in general, development impact fees are charged at time of permit, a building permit. It would be at that time or soon after that, once that fee is collected, it is then repaid back to right. the developer. Right, or it's offset, meaning it can either be collected and we reimburse them, or, or they don't pay that portion of the fee, and their fee's reduced. Um, water resources is the other fee that we have. Um, this is for surface water rights um, off project. We do have what's off project and then on project. If you recall, on project is SRP. There's no fee associated for those areas that are within the SRP service area, which is just that small um, southeastern portion of our city. Um, everywhere else will be a water resource fee associated with our cost for purchasing basically our water rights. Um, our cap water rights are... are um, um, Helia River Indian community rights, all of those, you know, or GRIC, all of those things that we've, um, we have to purchase in order for us to ensure that we have the water supply needed to serve growth. Does that include our capital? Uh, does that include everything when it comes to purchasing CAP water? Yeah, so it's everything that we've purchased already and that we're still having, uh, that we still have capacity available, right? So we not only purchase water rights so that we have the rights 
to, to pull that water out of the, the ground, allocation. right? Yeah. But we also have um, future water rights that we need to purchase. So it's kind of a combination. Again, it's that hybrid approach. What do we have that we already have and that, that we're making available for future growth? And then what do we have in the future that we have to purchase? And then the, what we have to pay CAP for maintenance? That's, that's not separate. part of this. That's not separate. Yes, that comes out of our water rates that we charge um, for, for our water delivery. Okay. Yes. And that was it. I wanted to just quickly explain our quick our timeline. We are obviously um, in the, our 60-day review for our draft study. We've held uh, we held a stakeholder meeting in May. We held another one last week, and we have another one next week. Next week, we're going to cover some of the non-utility fees. We have our public hearing scheduled for February 19th. We are on a tight schedule for this one. If we miss any of these dates, it's really going to affect our ability to make these effective in September. Um, so we're going to keep this on pace. You'll see us probably four more times in public hearing and then, and then um, the council adoption. So um, you thought you got rid of me with the budget, but now you got me for impact fees this year. So <laughs> with that, I can answer any other questions. Council? I just want to clarify one more thing with regards to impact fees not paying for the um, the the level of quality that we have produced in the first portion of our city. So now we're building the second half of our city. The impact fees are not there. The the dollars that it is going to take to build a balanced and equitable uh, amenity package in the north as, as we have in the south is going to come out of our general fund. Is that correct? Uh, it will come out of a variety of sources. Um, general fund could be one of them. Okay. But geo bonds, things like that as well. All right. So for the greater good um, and, you know, the good of all of our citizens, our city is committed to keep up that level of quality. Is that correct? That. That is what you have, this council has said they want to do, yes. I think it's very important for our citizens to know that we are not going to decrease the, the level of quality um, in our city, you know, for parks or libraries or infrastructure in any way based on what our state legislature has done with impact fees. Thank you. Comments? All right, anything else? Uh, just a quick conclusion on that, and thank you for bringing up that, that comment, Mayor, is, is exactly right, as equity is huge for us, making sure that we have the same standards throughout this community, and we're, we're committed to that, and you've seen that in your spending plans. These impact fees are incredibly complex. They uh, require legal scrutiny. They require involvement by stakeholders, incredible complexity that uh, our staff is committed to because they're worth it. Uh, no matter what we're seeing with regard to all of these pieces, it has helped to fund almost every new street that we've had in the last decade. All of our new neighborhood parks, the community parks have been contributed, the public safety facility, they are critical. So we're so very fortunate to have a staff and including led by Katie to help us navigate through this. We hear really good positive comments from our stakeholders, including the Home Builders Association, who've used us as kind of a, a positive poster child uh, in the organ in, throughout the, the state in, in working with dealings with jurisdictions. So uh, while we know this gets complex, we really appreciate your time and know that we will be coming to you for formal action here in the spring. Thank you. All right. Thank you. With that, we are adjourned until our 7 p.m. meeting. The Mayor and City Council welcome you to the Peoria City Council meeting. As a courtesy to others, please silence all phones. If you would like to address an issue that is on the agenda, or if you would like to speak to the council regarding a non-agenda item, please complete a speaker request form, which can be found in the front lobby of the Peoria City Council Chambers or in the tray to the left of the speaker's podium. Please place the completed speaker request form in the second tray to the left of the speaker's podium labeled Request to Speak. All speakers will have three minutes to complete their comments. A countdown clock is easily visible on the left side of the wall behind the City Council dais. Only items listed on the agenda may be addressed by the Council. Since items presented as part of a speaker's request have not been listed on the agenda and due to the requirements of open meeting laws, the Council will be unable to respond to items presented as part of the speaker's request. However, please be aware that your comments will be noted. The speaker's name will be called to speak at the appropriate time in the order that the forms were received.
Thank you for your interest and participation in the Peoria City Council meeting. The Peoria City Council meeting will now come to order. Please rise for a moment of quiet reflection and the Pledge of Allegiance led by Council Member Edwards. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. The clerk will please call the roll. Mayor Carlett. Here. Vice Mayor Binsbacher. Here. Mayor Pro Tem Hunt. Here. Council Member Patena. Here. Council Member Finn. Here. Council Member Edwards. Here. Council Member Leone. Here. Council Liaison Johnson. Here. And Council Liaison Gilbertson. Here. Thank you. Good evening and welcome to the Peoria City Council meeting of January 17th, 2019. The first item on our agenda this evening is a presentation, proclamation recognizing Centennial High football team as state champions. I would like to invite uh, Coach Taylor and his team to join me and Council Member Finn on the chamber floor. There we go. All right. We are going to double team you here tonight. I am going to read a proclamation from the city of, Pe of Peoria. So if you'll just bear with me here while I do a few whereases. City of Peoria proclamation, whereas the mayor and council of the city of Peoria recognize the 2018 Centennial High School football team for their outstanding dedication and effort in becoming the 5A state football champions. And whereas coach Richard Taylor has been an exemplary leader for the team since its incep inception in 1990, and whereas Coach Taylor and the Centennial Coyotes have competed in the high school football playoffs for the past 18 years in a row, whereas the Coyotes have persevered to become seven-time state champions, whereas high school sports teaches players about commitment, teamwork, sportsmanship, and leadership, skills that prepare students for a future beyond high school, and whereas the city of Peoria and the entire community are proud of the Centennial Coyotes and their achievements. Now, therefore, I, Kathy Carlett, mayor of the city of Peoria in the state of Arizona, do hereby proclaim January 22nd as Peoria Centennial Coyotes State Football Champions Day. And I have set my hand and the seal on this day, January 22nd, 2019. Congratulations. What's your name, young man? Ned. Ned? Ned what? Ned Kennedy. Ned Kennedy. Nice to meet you. So <clears throat> I was going to put your kids on the spot, but I've only got two of you, so I'm going to put you both on the spot. Ned, I'm going to start with you. The mayor already gave you the answer, but how long has Coach Taylor been coach at Centennial High School? In 1990. So how many, how many years is that, Ned? Come on, show us the math. Coach started when he was five. Okay. <clears throat> so, Ned, another question for you. So, if you think about college football, are you a college football fan? 
Okay. Who would you think is, oh, Michigan. Oh, it's, this is done. We're done. <laughs> We're absolutely done. <clears throat> who, would you, who would you consider to be one of the most successful college coaches currently? Built a dynasty. Okay. Anybody else that maybe had a little better run over the past few years? Rhymes with Babin. Nick Saban. Good answer, Nick. You're doing well here, son. <laughs> Coach Taylor, do you know when Saban took over for Alabama? I do not. Okay, 2007 is the correct answer. So, this is where it gets kind of fun. So, since 2007, I'm going somewhere with this, okay? Ned's looking at me like, what is he doing? <clears throat> going back to 2007, who had the best single season record? Coach Taylor or Nick Saban? Do, 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 do. It's actually a tie. You both had a perfect season. Which? <laughs> Somebody send this to Nick Saban when I'm done. Please. Please. <clears throat> Who did it first, though? Saban or Taylor? Ned. Taylor. That is correct. Well done. Well done, coach. We're almost done, I promise. I'm going to get you guys off the, uh, off the hot seat. How many games do you think Alabama played since 2007 until current? This is math again, I know. This is tough. Correct, 167, well done. 167 games were played by Alabama from the time that he took over until now. Coach Taylor, how many games do you think you played since 2007? Not even close, 167. You guys played the exact same number of games, which I thought was ironic. But here's the point that I'm getting to. How many of those games did you win out of the 167 games that you played? Not sure, but I remember every one. <laughs> Fine, how many, how many losses have you had? <laughs> That's a true coach answer right there. Your record coach was 149 and 18. Did you know that? 149 and 18. Do you know what Nick Saban's record was? 146 and 21. You have a better record since 2007 than Coach Nick Saban. You didn't know that, did you? No. You learned something today. Try to be the teacher. Teach the teacher. Teach the coach. Congratulations. You guys had a phenomenal season. Congratulations. Thanks for letting me put you both on the spot. So and thanks for playing Saban Taylor Challenge. I appreciate it. We'll tell you what you won when you guys get to the back there. <laughs> uh, no, no. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. Okay, the next item on the agenda this evening is the consent agenda. All items on the consent agenda are considered to be routine or have been previously reviewed by the City Council and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a council member so requests, in which event the item will be removed from the general order of business and considered in its normal sequence on the agenda. Council, are there any items to be removed from consent? All right, seeing none then, is there a motion? I move to accept the consent agenda. Do I have a second? second? Okay, a motion and a second. Council, please vote on consent. And the consent agenda passes unanimously. We will now move on to new business. And we are going to be hearing items 17 and 18 together. Uh, we'll vote on them separately. Item 17R is Intergovernmental Agreement Amendment, Maricopa County, Happy Valley Parkway to Loop 303, from Loop 303 to Lake Pleasant Parkway. And then 18R is Intergovernmental Agreement Amendment, Maricopa County, Pinnacle Peak Road Improvements from 99th Avenue to 91st Avenue. And I will turn it over to City Manager Jeff Tyne. Thank you, Mayor and Council. And we have Adina Lund, our Development and Engineering Director, that will provide this presentation. Thank you. 
Good evening, Mayor and Council. I'm happy to be here tonight to talk about the two items the mayor just mentioned. It was a mouthful, so I'm glad that she said it instead of myself. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit tonight about our efficient transportation network and how we sometimes leverage regional partnerships to help us achieve your goals. So first, I want to talk about the two projects, Happy Valley Parkway and Pinnacle Peak Road. Happy Valley extends from Lake Pleasant Parkway to Loop 303. In, in February of 2017, Council approved the original IGA with the county to contribute financial, financially to the project for the area in yellow and to have us annex the road. That amount was for $2.5 million. The costs have increased since then, as you know. We look at our projects as they go through design, and at 30, 60, 90 percent and final, we update those estimates. There's been considerable changes, so we went back to the county and asked if they would participate. So this amendment is their participation of an additional $2.5 million. Pinnacle Peak Road from 91st to 99th went to council in January of 17. You also approved the original IGA, and the county agreed to contribute $3 million towards this project. Costs have also increased. We went back to them, and they agreed to contribute an additional $1 million. So let's talk about those projects and why we have a regional partnership with them. Happy Valley Parkway, when it was just a city project, was from Lake Pleasant Parkway to the Agua Fria River. We were widening the road from four lanes to six lanes. We were providing the landscape median and the bridge aesthetics you see here. That would have left us with a section from the river to the Loop 303 that was only two lanes in each direction. And that's not what your vision is. We don't want to increase our capacity and then have it reduced when we're getting near a major freeway. So that's why we started this partnership. <coughs> With the partnership, we also look at bike lanes and pedestrian connections. That's part of your vision for our network. So once again, the bike lanes would have started at Happy Valley Road all the way at 67th Avenue during our, one of our previous projects, would have gone to the river and would have stopped between the river and the 303, where they then pick up and go into Vistancia. So this project will complete that section so that we will have a network for cars, for bicycles and for pedestrians. And once again, that includes the landscape enhancements that the county does not do on their roadways. Pinnacle Peak Road from 91st to 99th, that was originally a developer project to just do the widening on the south half of the road. When they were doing that, there was no landscape median. We would have not been able to stripe the bike lanes for that project either. So by going to the county and getting that funding, we can provide a complete street within your vision of providing pedestrian, bicycle, and auto connectivity for segments of our roadways. So the part that's always important, where are we with these schedules? Happy Valley Parkway, the design is complete. We are currently talking to the various landowners to try to get those easements in play. The last thing we want to do is start construction without all the land rights. That would put us on hold, and that would not be a good scenario. So we're finalizing those, and then we're going to go out for a low bid, hopefully in spring. And that project will be coming back to you for approval. It's a very large construction contract. So you'll see me again in the spring. Pinnacle Peak Road, as I said, is being constructed by the developers. And because we like to complicate things, it's two different developers. The first section from 91st to 95th is being constructed by Mary Kay. It's currently under construction. The second section from 95th to 99th will be under Toll Brothers. That one has had a few hiccups with utility work. There's a large 20-inch Kinder Morgan gas line underneath the roadway. And it exists today, but whenever you do a project over a utility line, they get to look at the requirements that are needed for today's standard. So we're working with them to find out what those requirements are, and then we can start that section. We're hopeful it will be in spring, and that both sections will be completed by this time next year. So with that, we're asking you to approve the amendments for this funding for Maricopa County. 17R is the first amendment to the IGA to improve and annex Happy Valley Parkway 
from Loop 303 to Lake Pleasant Parkway, and you're authorizing the budget amendment to take that 2.5 million from our general fund and put it within the project. That way we can start the project and then get repaid from them. And then item 18R is the same for Pinnacle Peak Road with a dollar amount of $1 million. Do you have any questions before you vote? Council, any questions or comments? I have a question. Yes, Council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Adina, can you go back to the, uh, the, map, the uh, picture? There you go. So on the on the Pinnacle Peak, um, when is 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 the project um, still, or either Phase One or Phase Two, still to include a um, a signal at 95th? At 95th Avenue, we have looked at the traffic volumes, and at this time, it does not warrant a traffic signal. We are putting in the underground conduit so that in the future we do not have to tear up the road. We will just need to design the signal and then install the equipment. So even with all of the new construction in that area, it's not warranted because the traffic in that area currently uh, for students entering and leaving Liberty High School is, is pretty bad. That is correct. We've looked at it and luckily that high school is located within the center of that neighborhood. So they have many access locations to enter and exit the neighborhood. With intersections like this, we put them on our watch list and then every year we do the analysis to see if it is time for us to start initiate the design process. So which developer has the ultimate responsibility for building that signal? Is it Toll Brothers or is it Mary Kay? City of Peoria. City of Peoria. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Thank you. So the design of the Happy Valley Bridge, uh, that looks beautiful, fabulous. Uh, I really love the, the um, upgraded bridge design. Is that stacked stone there? It is stacked stone and it's beautiful. It and is, it looks beautiful and it looks very safe um, for pedestrians. We hope there are some pedestrians there, definitely bicycle riders, absolutely. Um, so, you know, kudos for the great design on that. That's wonderful. Did you have a... I'm sorry. Would you like to speak, Vice Mayor? Like <laughs> Please. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, you know, I just wanted to say um, a couple things. That uh, the uh, the relationship that you you've built um, and continue to to grow, nurture and grow with the county is so important. And this is a great example of how important these relationships are to get them to work with us on these types of pro projects and absorb some of these costs because they're so expensive to do. But what you didn't mention that I'm really, really grateful for is the, um, the engagement in the community and how receptive you and your entire team in the engineering department have been. Um, and Andy Granger too, who led the charge before you to really come out and talk with people in the community, particularly in the Vastancia area, because at you know one time, one point in time that that four lanes worked okay but um, as we've grown it's just become a scary situation for the cyclists and pedestrians that use that road and this is going to be life-changing for them and just create a much safer situation and they are thrilled and I am thrilled and thank you very much I definitely support this okay no further comments then um, I want to entertain a motion on item 17R. I'll motion. Motion. Second? Second? Second. All right. A motion and a second. Uh, this is uh, Intergovernmental Agreement Amendment, Maricopa County, Happy Valley Parkway from Loop 303 to Lake Pleasant Parkway. This is to... Um, to add an additional $2.5 million from the county to the city of Peoria for this construction. Council, please vote. Try again. All right, that passes unanimously. And now item 18R, Intergovernmental Agreement Amendment, Maricopa County, Pinnacle Peak Road improvements from 99th Avenue to 91st Avenue. This is an additional 1.0 from the county to the city of Peoria. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Motion and a second. Council, please vote. Second. 
passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next item on the agenda is 19R, discussion and possible action upon Peoria, Arizona Historical Society lease agreement. And I will turn it over to Mr. Tyne for a staff report. Excuse me, Mayor. Yes. May I make a statement? Yes, you please? may, please. Okay, uh, obviously as a longtime resident of this area, and this area goes back to my family living here, I have been closely associated with the Peoria Historical Society for a number of years. I am a lifetime member. It breaks my heart to have uh, seen what's been going on between the members for the last couple of years, and I've been close with many of the members on both sides of this issue. The reality is that not only are the facilities unavailable to residents, the society itself is not active. Back in 2017, I did have an interest in seeing new individuals forming a more active board. That said, I have not been involved in any city decision to lock the buildings. I worry about the public perception of my role in this decision. Therefore, I plan to defer my decision to the rest of my colleagues on the council. While there's no legal restriction or obligation placed on me, I plan on refusing myself on the discussion and the vote on this item. Thank you, Councilmember Hunt. You are recused. All right, we will resume. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And as you can see, we have uh, David Benton and Vanessa Hickman also that will provide a presentation. So Vanessa and I will go through this with you. We wanted to discuss what is certainly a unique situation for us in regard to our contract with the Peoria, Arizona Historical Society uh, for the use of facilities in the Old Town area. So just quickly, a little bit of history. Um, since the uh, 90s, uh, the Historical Society has leased out five different city-owned buildings, but probably more important, as you can see, facilities like the one in the picture uh, along 83rd Avenue have actually been in the city's possession since about 1978 when we purchased them from the Peoria Unified School District. But since the 90s, the Historical Society uh, has leased out that property um, for a nominal rate of about a dollar a year. The city's interest in leasing the buildings to the Historical Society is to increase uh, public awareness and the city's rich history and legacy. As a result of that, the contract calls for the Historical Society to continually conduct meetings, store important uh, artifacts and documents on site, and operate a museum. Uh, and indeed, they do do so. Uh, one thing to probably note is the city is not in charge of managing any of those items that are within the premises of that. That is in a purview of the Historical Society. So just a summary of some of the events recently. Uh, in 2011, this lease was reviewed by the City Council and then renewed and updated. Uh, more recently, though, there have been some internal disputes within the Historical Society that have been uh, ongoing, certainly for the last three years or more. And in fact, there are now two separate groups that lay sole claim to be the acting serving board for the association. Um, so this, of course, creates somewhat of a dilemma. In January of 2018, the city, in an effort to try to resolve the situation, uh, did offer to hire a third-party referee at the city's expense to help kind of resolve that issue. Uh, that was ultimately declined. Uh, shortly after, the two parties of the Historical Society then filed lawsuits against each other in Maricopa County Superior Court. So, because of that dilemma, there is some uncertainty about whom the city should be conducting uh, business with, and there's confusion on who has rightful claims to the artifacts and documents that are stored within the buildings. So the current situation, uh, to this date, the buildings are locked to preserve the contents that are in there, and the activity is dormant at the site. Um, the, as you, we had mentioned, there is litigation that is going on between the two parties of the Historical Society that is ongoing. We do not know of any resolution that we see in sight. Um, as well, city-owned public facilities, as a result, uh, cannot be used by the city nor its residents for any purpose uh, as a result of this. So, of course, this uh, shouldn't continue forever. And so, due to this protracted litigation, 
uh, the impasse between the two boards, the concern that the buildings remain inaccessible to the public, and uh, concern of the condition of the contents, the staff is recommending uh, the following recommendation. That is, in the interest of public necessity and convenience, uh, that we exercise a contract clause that ends the lease, giving a 180-day notice. Uh, we, in addition to that, would recommend uh, seeking assurances, probably through a plan of the Historical Society, the Historical Society to provide a plan on how the items that are contained within the premises will be accessible to the rightful owners, and that the property is uh, that is there within all of the articles and artifacts and documents are appropriately inventoried and preserved. So with that, that that's the staff presentation, but we are here to address any questions that you might have on this situation. Okay. Council, any questions? Yes, Council Member Patena. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, Lanessa, how many, how many board members on, on each side of this are currently in existence? Mayor, Council Member Patena, the ex exact number I, I do not have, but I can tell you there are multiple uh, parties on each side of the litigation that claim to be members of the board. So I believe there are uh, three plaintiffs and there are at least six defendants. So multiple parties on each side. On each side. And, and it said uh, that there's been no movement either way. In your opinion, What's it going to take to get this off the dime? Uh, Mayor, Council Member Patena, th so this matter was filed in uh, a year ago. It was filed in January of 2018, and it's, there's going to need to be some sort of, of motivation. The parties are in discovery, and we have not seen any sort of what they call dispositive motions filed to try and Resolve the litigation again, as uh, as Mr. Tyne stated. We tried to move forward with with mediation, and that was turned down. So there will need to be some sort of action uh, to try and and get the parties to to resolve their dispute, or at least to take the city out of it, so that we can um, have use of the buildings. Thank you, Council Member. Ben. Thank you, Mayor. I just want to make sure that I've kind of got this wrapped up in my head. Our only involvement with this has been leasing the buildings to the Historical Society. The, the city doesn't take part in operating or anything along with that. Is that correct? Councilmember Vin, that's correct. Okay, and it's city, it's city property. It's the citizens' property. Right, correct. Uh, in most of these buildings were indeed purchased by the city in 1978 for use for okay. the residents. And this has not been open to the public for over a year? They've been basically locked out? Yes, Councilman Rez, Okay, and nothing would prohibit uh, the Historical Society from leasing in a strip mall or anything else to do the exact same thing that they're doing currently. Is that correct? Not that I understand. Don't okay. believe there's any impediments. I, I do not, I'm not aware of any impediments either. So we're basically giving them 180 days to figure this out, or we're gonna take the cit citizens' buildings back. That, Is that correct? That's the staff recommendation. Okay. Very good, thank you. Um, so just to clarify, because I can see how the, the lines may be blurred in some cases, but the city of Peoria does not run the Peoria Historical Society. We have no ownership over them, no management over them, no authority over how they operate or the contents that they have inventoried for their historical purposes. Mayor Carla, that, that is correct, and hence why we have to enter into a contractual obligation to work with the, the society on these affairs. Okay. It is quite unfortunate that they have not been able to move forward with a resolution on their own, and the city now has to give them a 180-day notification, although that is six months. It's a solid six months in order to decide who is in charge and what is going to happen with the contents of those buildings that have been entrusted to them. Um, I hope that they are capable of making these choices. So, Council, if there's no further discussion, I do have some speaker request forms. 
And I will call the first speaker to the podium, and you have three minutes to speak. Uh, Ms. Loretta Barnes, if you would state your name and address for the record, please. Loretta Barmas, 9426 West Mission Lane, Peoria, 85345. Good enough. Hi, everybody. Perfect. Good. Thank you. I just heard about this meeting just a couple of days ago, so I'm here just to give you a little brief synopsis. I kind of ask that you kind of think beyond what's been presented. Part of the board situation between, I'll go by A and B. And I'm on the A side, and we have a lot more board members intact. We had our meeting last year in 2017. And then there's another side, which we'll call the B side. Us on the A side agreed to mediation. We thought, perfect, this will end the dispute. It was the other side that denied the mediation. All of the artifacts and everything in the historical society, if no one has had any entrance in there and there was no damage done while we were not present, are fine. There's nothing in there that's gonna cause any chemical hazard, nothing's gonna rot away, it, it's all intact. I was the president for approximately three years running and in that time frame, we went to having from a very low budget because we were only supported by donations and the Pioneer Banquet that we had every year. We had a very low balance in the checking accounts of maybe around four, five, six thousand dollars at the time I took over. When I quit the position, I left thirty-six thousand dollars in the bank accounts for pause. Pause can make it work, and we proved in those three years that I was involved that it did work. We started getting notoriety started coming back up. We got signs posted on Olive and Peoria Avenue. So if you give us the chance, we're willing to now, we'll go to mediation right now. There has been new evidence provided, so there is some more things that are involved that the attorneys would have to attest to, and there's certain things that we can't talk about. But I will tell you this, that when we were in charge and we were running the place, it was the best that it had been in years. Thank you for Thank your you. comments. All right, I have one more speaker request form, and that is from Mr. Mike Heath. Sir, if you would state your name and address. For the record, you have three minutes to speak. I'm Mike Heath, 12676 North 77th Avenue, Peoria, Arizona, 85381, in the Palo Verde District. Um, this is said also for myself, somebody that watered those plants three times a week during the summer to keep them living. Uh, the mu museum has been shut down for over three years. It's been closed for three of the family festivals where, where the, the opportunity for the community wasn't allowed to even uh, make, to go in and view any artifacts. Uh, several people and supporters formed, as Loretta uh, alluded to, elected board and officers. And we, along with Carl Swinson, the previous city manager, had uh, endorsed the, the plan of mediation and that was gonna be final. Whatever said, we, we were willing. Not only was it rejected from the other side, they personally sued us. So we would uh, um, definitely like to have this put behind us. And with that being said, uh, the other party um, hasn't, it didn't have it open before we, we got involved. So I don't have anything else to say. I mean, that hasn't already been said. So if you have any questions for me, I'm here. Thank you for yeah. your comments. All right, I now have another um, speaker request form from Mr. David Sandoval. Sir, if you will state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes to speak. David Sandoval, 9841 West Potter Drive, Peoria, Arizona, 85382. Mayor Carlott, Vice Mayor Binsbacher, Council Members. Um, when I was asked to, to sit on the uh, Peoria, Arizona Historical Society Board, um, I, I was honored for many reasons. Um, you know, certainly uh, I'm a resident of Peoria for the past 24 years. 
but um, you know, my, my family has a rich history in the city of Peoria. You know, with uh, sort of my mom's you know little Pueblo home is still there on Madison Avenue, on 80, 84th Avenue, roughly. And you know, my aunt was the first Hispanic woman business owner in the city of Peoria. Um, I have my aunts and uncles who graduated from Peoria High in the early 1930s. So a lot of um, a lot of proud uh, proud moments, uh, without question. Uh, you know, my wife graduated from Cactus. Our kids from Park Ridge and and then uh, Sunrise Mountain. Um, I, I don't disagree. Um, you know, I'm, I'm newly elected, so unfortunately, uh, to this point, I haven't had the opportunity to really exercise um, uh, my passion, certainly for the city of Peoria, um, and to certainly uh, preserve the, the the history of the city of Peoria. Um, you know, uh, it's being a board member uh, for the Peoria Unified um, high, uh, School District. Um, you know, the Historical Society what is, is certainly a partner of our district. It's a, um, a platform that allows us to educate our youth um, about the history of Peoria. Um, where we brought students in and uh, on field trips to the old schoolhouse, et cetera. That said, I agree, it's, it's unfortunate, it's a disservice uh, to our community, uh, what's going on right now. Um, and, you know, I fully understand, you know, as a city, uh, you know, um, that's where you're coming from a place of that uh, to make this decision um, to exercise, you know, certainly the, the clause in the contract. Um, you know, my ask is, is that we do um, um, hopefully um, are able to come together as organizations or, or boards, uh, walk into a room humble, you know, with a very solutions oriented and uh, outcome so we can, again, um, take, you know, all uh, any, any other, um, I guess, considerations out and only focus on the community and the residents of the city of Peoria so this historical society can open its doors so everybody um, in our community uh, can enjoy, you know, what this city was built on. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. All right, I now have another speaker request form from Mr. Bill Berku. Sir, if you will come to the podium and state your name and address for the record, you have three minutes to speak. Thank you. I'm Dr. William Burke, 12335 North 77th Drive, uh, Peoria. And uh, I am the chair of the uh, Peoria Historical Society. Uh, we are currently uh, uh, in litigation with the other group that has claimed the status or claimed, claimed to be uh, a historical society. Um, We've been involved and uh, with our attorneys, and again, we'll start de deposing our first witness on Wednesday of the other group. Uh, the, as I came, was elected as chair after a, the, I don't know, many of the, of the other side apparently were on the, a board that was dissolved or, or there had been some, um, um, Dis disruptions or dispute within the within a group of people there. I assume the chair uh, was elected chair of the group that presently claims who we are, the Peoria Historical Society. Um, we uh, yes, we we've the city chose to lock the buildings uh, until we could reach some kind of uh, uh, mediation or or resolution to this, um, and. Uh, you know, we've got, there's a good deal of people, uh, old timers within the city of Peoria, whose artifacts are kept within those, that museum, who are also affiliated with, I don't know if it's their sites, but with the Peoria Historical Society that I chair. Mr. Ken Johnson has been one of the, you know, original people, uh, the gentleman with the tractors that's always you know, been involved, and several other people. So there, long before I came there, uh, came here, there, there has just been uh, a whole side of that of our old timers or pioneers within Peoria. Uh, we are going to, again, start deposing our uh, witnesses or the, the other side Wednesday of, uh, in a couple of weeks. Um, one of the things, I guess, as the time runs out here, is, is that I have become aware that members of the other side, for lack of anything else, had sold artifacts 
and belongings to some of the older families, and uh, you know we're alleging that that you know they have done, there's been malfeasance within that. Uh, in other words, and our desire is to preserve and protect the artifacts from the original uh, people, original members uh, of the community. We're uh, uh, still going to court or start deposing on Wednesday and uh, are deposing all of our witnesses and then we plan to take them to court uh, with, and Maricopa County has the depositions and, and the, uh, the date coming up. So we are in litigation to, um, in this matter and it's before the courts, so thank you. Thank you for your comments. I believe I have another speaker request form on the way. Thank you very much. This is Karen Garby. Would you please come to the podium and state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Karen Garby, 1171 South. <laughs> Wrong city. <laughs> uh, 9656 West Irma Lane, Peoria, Arizona, 85382. I wasn't going to speak tonight until Bill got up and made some very untrue statements about artifacts being sold. There has been nothing sold from the museum from the time I started working there, should say volunteering there, uh, till we were, I am going to say, in a meeting and this is for the courts to decide because we were sued. Removed and asked for the keys back. Everything was given to the other group and they didn't even open the museum for a year. They had ample time to have the museum up and running. When we saw that the museum was not being, the, the community was not being serviced. We sent notice to every member, had, a, had an election. We consider ourselves the rightful board of the museum. And we agreed to the arbitration because it's not our personal glory. We want the museums open for the city no matter who's running it, as long as the group is honest and forthright and has the buildings open to the community and provides the fourth grade field trips for our residents. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. All right, I have another speaker request form from Kathleen Moore. If you would please um, proceed to the podium and state your name and address for the record. You have three minutes to speak. Hello, Council Mayor. My name is Kathleen Moore, 5352 West Palm Leaf Lane, Glendale, Arizona. And I'm also fourth generation Purian. I'd like to speak to the statement that Mr. Tyne mentioned, and it was regarding that <clears throat> we weren't wanting to negotiate or anything like that, or not allow anyone into the museum. We tried in vain to get Ken Johnson to be allowed to retrieve his memorial outfit, his from World War II, other things he does on a yearly basis, but to no avail, the city would not allow him in. And I'm kind of concerned because the city recognized quite a few military, former military Koreans, and not the oldest one that we have sitting and that has served the city of Peoria for many, many years on pause board. And that's Ken Johnson from the beginning. And I'd like to go back to 2014 and that was the year that the, the ones that are, most of the ones made up of this pause, whatever they are, A, B, C, whatever. They were all signed termination forms for Vicki Hunt for misuse of funds. 
And then it went on that we were doing fine. We did this. We were working together until one day, all of a sudden, we were no one, zero. Because my teeth, Loretta, Karen Garvey, the, the very group that signed that form and had me do an audit for a number of months with a Phoenix Police Department because it was not conducive to have the Peoria Police help. So those findings were found. And then we're going about our business, and then I'm still auditing, and then I'm finding out that the group that we're dealing with and that we're working with, with Loretta being president, we're doing things that were not conducive to our PAWS members, nor the board. Therefore, when we were there, yes, I do have receipts of Karen Garvey selling a desk of some sort or a bench to another member of the board. That is ludicrous. So I'm here in front of you to let you know we have been wanting more than anything to open up PAWS and continue supporting PAWS as we have in the past. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments. Okay, Mr. Tyne, Ms. Hickman, would you please reiterate um, the staff recommendation? Sure, absolutely. Uh, so the staff recommendation is in recognition of um, um, all of the different circumstances that are occurring in uh, recognition that the uh, is not control over the assets, that, uh, that this is city property that remains locked and unavailable to residents in recognition of all of those. The recommendation is to, uh, in the interest of public necessity and convenience, exercise a contract clause in the existing contract that ends the lease uh, 180 days from notification to the Historical Society Board. Uh, and in addition to that is to develop a plan and to get some kind of assurance the items contained on the premises will be accessible to the rightful owners of those articles and to uh, also that the property uh, within those facilities, the historical artifacts and documents, are both inventoried and preserved. Okay, so it's, it's a two-part recommendation. It is giving these parties six months notification to work out their differences or their commonalities, however you want to call that, work out whatever they need to work out, and at the same time um, for them to develop someone, whoever they deem is in charge of this, uh, to develop some kind of a plan for the um, contents of these premises. Yes, that's correct, Mayor. And at the end of that, 180 days, the buildings will then return back to the city, full control. Yes, that is correct. If the parties do not come up with a plan for the contents within that 180 days, and the buildings revert to the full control of the city, we will then have to develop our own plan for the disbursement or return of those of the contents, is that correct? Yeah, Mayor Carla, that is correct. It's similar to a landlord-tenant type of a relationship where indeed the city will then have to decide what is the appropriate way to address uh, the artifacts and documents in there. And that would include uh, working through a process to identify who are the rightful owners and making sure that we do the appropriate steps to be an effective custodian. We'll follow all legal steps that are needed uh, in such a circumstance. I don't know if Vanessa, any other thoughts to that? Uh, no, Jeff, I think you covered it. We, we as, as Jeff said, we will make sure that the items are, uh, to the best of our ability, accounted for, inventoried, and we're working closely with the parties to ensure that the items are um, either returned to their rightful owners or logged and, uh, again, inventoried and stored. Okay, and... Vanessa, as the city attorney, would you please state what would be the correct motion that we should make in order to comply with staff recommendations? Uh, yes, Mayor, I'm happy to do that. So I think the motion would be uh, to move to, give me just a second, let me get to the. Sorry, I didn't mean to catch you no, off that's, guard that's there. fine. Just wanna make sure that we say this in the proper way. <laughs> 
<coughs> in the interest of public necessity and convenience to terminate the lease and provide written notice of 180 days to the Peoria Arizona Historical Society. Does that, does that work? I don't have a written motion in front of me. Jeff, do you have one? Yeah, in the interest of public necessity and convenience, exercise the contract clause to terminate the lease 180 days from notification. Okay, so, so basically what we're looking at there. Yes. Thank you. All right, Council, is there any further um, discussion? Council Member Finn? Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to make a comment here as I listened to everyone that spoke. And um, I know that this council has had a lot of discussions about this, but my, my feelings are we are not here to be the arbiter and a civil dispute. And I feel that we've been entangled in this because we carry the lease on this but it's not something for this council to, to decide. And I could see the passion on both sides. I'll be honest with you, I appreciate the passion on both sides, but I'm asking both parties, be passionate for the citizens of this, of this city, be passionate for the people that actually took some, some prize belongings and put it in either party's possession and do the right thing in the next 180 days to get this resolved and get it resolved for the people that entrusted you, please. I mean, if you really wanna take a stretch on it, I can see the exact same digging in in this country right now. And I don't think anybody, anybody feels that uh, that's the right direction for the country. I don't feel what's happening right now is the right direction for the historical society. Maybe it's a stretch to go with what's going on in the country, but both sides are passionate. Do what's right. Please, you got 180 days. That's a lot more time than I hope the federal government has to figure out their issues. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Any further discussion? All right. Well, then, do I have a motion to concur with the words of our city attorney? Motion and a second. Motion and a second. Council, please vote. And... Item 19R passes unanimously. Thank you. <laughs> All right, the next item on the agenda is call to the public for non-agenda items. If you wish to address an, an <laughs> issue that is not on the city council agenda, please fill out a speaker request form and place it in the bin next to the speaker's podium. And I have not received any requests to speak for non-agenda items, so we will now move on to reports from city manager. Mr. Tyne. Great, thank you, Mayor and Council. Appreciate uh, the opportunity. Just uh, two items that we wanted to speak to. One item we're going to table till next time. But, um, the first is just uh, to notify all of you that we received notification we were accepted to participate in Arizona State University's Project Cities program. This is a highly competitive process and we are proud to have been selected. Just to give you a little bit of background, Project Cities is a 12 to 24 month partnership with Arizona State's Global Institute of Sustainability. But in reality, it's much more than that. Uh, what happens is ASU does partner with Arizona Cities to engage their students and their faculty from a number of different Arizona State University departments on a number of range of issues that generally relate to sustainability and livability projects. The students work through university courses, which provides hands-on research, designs, and deliverables to the city's projects. We're very excited about this. Really what we're going to have is an opportunity for students to work on Peoria-centric issues uh, and really have them bring an energy energy and enthusiasm and innovative approaches to some of our more difficult city problems. Uh, and we really are excited about uh, the progress that this brings and just the partnership it brings uh, in working with Arizona State University. So I wanted to acknowledge a couple people, especially Economic Efficiency and Sustainability Manager Lisa Estrada. She submitted the application for the program and, and proposed a, a number of different projects. And there's more to come, but we're very excited to partner with Arizona State on this important endeavor. That's big news. Thank you. Is that all? Uh, one more item I did uh, want for Chief uh, Art Miller to provide us an update regarding recruitment process and actually promotional opportunities at the police department here.
Council. Um, I'm so happy today to announce some promotions that we had in our police department. Um, first of all, these are exciting times for the uh, Peoria Police Department. Uh, through a series of retirements, as well as some people that were on promotional lists, waiting for the uh, right time in their life to decide to, um, to promote, um, they did. And uh, I'd like to announce the uh, Jennifer Rosen was promoted to Police Community Service Supervisor. She's there on the left. Uh, officers Amanda Gaines, Christopher Bauer, and Daniel Stipp were all promoted to sergeant. And Sergeant, uh, former Sergeant John Yearbos was promoted to lieutenant. What's important about these promotions is that these are the people that are in the street uh, supervising our personnel, both civilian and sworn. They're the ones that are getting our initiatives as a department uh, to move forward. Uh, I'm gonna depend on them and lean heavily on them to get um, what our uh, what our edict is and then what the direction we get from council on on some of the programs that you might be interested in uh, We are a very inclusive department, and we are also a very uh, I'd like to think of us as a go-to department So keep that in mind in, in the future uh, I'd also like to mention that we are in the recruiting process to fill vacancies because every time you promote someone another vacancy is, is created um, That is uh, as far as promotions go excuse me as far as promotions go uh, I want you all to know, too, that we are in the midst of uh, creating a honor guard. Well, the police honor guard will be doing interviews for those uh, candidates uh, in about a week. And uh, so far, we have about 20, 20 officers and civilian staff that are interested in that position. We're going to have a 16-member honor guard that we can use for public functions and represent our city and our department the, the best we can. So that's my end of my report. Thank you. Thank you. That's great news. Oh, wow. And promotions from within, can't have enough of those. That's wonderful. Thank Council, you. did you have any comments? No. We're all Thank shaking you. our heads. Yay, congratulations. <laughs> Thank congratulations you, to all of those promotions. Thank you for letting us know. Thank you, Mayor. That's all we have. All right. I will now move on to reports from City Council, and we will start with Youth Council Liaison Johnson. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, this morning I had the honor to perform in a skit uh, at the Stand Up, Speak Up, Save a Life conference. Uh, this conference teaches students about how to deal with depression, bullying, and how to, uh, and how to save a life from suicide. Uh, I hope that the skit I performed in helped teach and bring awareness about some of these issues. Uh, I was also very happy to see that Police Chief Miller could make it to the conference and to see Peoria schools represented there. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Patena. Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> On January 17th, uh, myself, along with the mayor and several council people, uh, got to go to um, Huntington University for a celebration. Uh, it was an opportunity for them to showcase what they do here in Peoria. Uh, we sat at our table with the president of uh, Huntington University, quite an interesting lady. Um, we heard from facil uh, the faculty and from students. Um, Huntington, you, you, the, the relationship that we have with Huntington University is quite amazing. They love being in Peoria. We love having them. Uh, and I think that they're going to continue uh, to grow here. Um, I want to mention something uh, in terms of customer service. Um, my uh, recycle bin uh, broke the other day, the wheels fell off, and so I told my wife, just call the city, and, and, and she did. And so within an hour and a half, I had my new recycle bin. Uh, I think that's just amazing customer service, and, and I know that that's the way we do customer service all the time in this city. So congratulations to, uh, to our city for all of that. Um, I'd like to congratulate Centennial High School. Uh, 18 times in the playoffs, seven state championships, and I believe they had three in a row. Uh, it's quite a dynasty. They're here in Peoria, and we should be very proud of, uh, of what they do in that school. And then lastly, congratulations to all the police who were, were promoted. Uh, always enjoy seeing our first responders uh, get, get promoted from within, uh, and always very grateful for the job they do. So that's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Councilmember Finn. I actually wasn't going to have any comments, but um, I want to let you know, Bill, that my recycle bin actually broke as well, and I didn't even have to call. <laughs> they literally put a brand new one right out there for me. So, 
Other than that, I have no other comments. Your mind, and that's a very <laughs> scary thing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Vice Mayor Binsbacher. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Centennial High School once again. Fantastic. Uh, also, congratulations to all of those that received uh, promotions in the Peoria Police Department. Love to see that. Those all those promotions from within. Um, I want to mention too on. Um, a couple Saturdays ago, I attended the music on the plaza right here by Theater Works, and it was fantastic. I absolutely loved it. Um, it's just, you know, people outside, it's quaint and welcoming, and um, it's free, free entertainment and really great entertainment um, from all around the valley, and it's just creating uh, an atmosphere. It's about placemaking, and that's what it feels like, and it's really amazing. So congratulations to the team that's behind that and putting all of that together. I know Mary Lou is really excited, and so am I, to see how that grows. Um, also, um, I want to thank Lisa Estrada. Um, I heard, I wasn't there, but I heard about the last sustain and gain class in the Mesquite District, which was a, a class on container gardening. And it was such a hit that there was, there was not enough room. And so this is just fantastic because it's a, it's a great problem to have. The next one coming up will be at Sunrise Mountain Library, is it? I believe. Um, it's a great problem to have and I'm thrilled and grateful that um, we're taking these classes in whatever city services we can to the northern part of our city where we don't have a community center. And so it kind of takes these opportunities to them and they get to participate and experience all of the great services that we offer as a city. So thank you for that. Thanks for um, sticking with it. And then also, um, last week we had... Um, an emergency operations center tour. And um, I won't go into all of that, but I want to thank Peoria Fire Medical for doing a fast, fantastic job. Chief Reese, Chief Bernard facilitated all of that. Um, very informative. Um, I want to thank all of the city leadership and PD. And really, my message in all of this is that it just reinforces how well run the city really is and that the steps that we're taking to be prepared and to keep our citizens safe. It was really eye-opening and I appreciated the opportunity. We just had the prickly petal up at Lake Pleasant this last weekend. Um, I was not able to attend that event, but I have to say I received a phone call from uh, Supervisor Hickman uh, telling me how excited he was to see how much it had grown, what a success it was, and how much that he values that partnership. So congratulations. That event too is a huge success and come a long way. Um, that's all I have. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Um, Council Member Edwards. Thank you, Mayor. Um, the only thing I wanted to talk about this, this, this evening was um, I had the honor this morning to walk with uh, Mayor Pro Tem Hunt and Chief Miller at the uh, fourth annual diversity um, walk. And I just want to thank, um, uh, Unity Walk, sorry, but I want to thank our diversity group for, for putting that on. It uh, was just a phenomenal event. We had about four to 500 students from all over Peoria schools that attended and got to uh, listen to some good words from the Mayor Pro Tem and listen to some great music and have some food on top of it. So I just want to thank the group for putting it on. And I just, I know it gets bigger every year and I know it's, it's harder to manage, but I just want you to know that uh, it does not go unnoticed. Uh, thank you for putting it on. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Hunt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, well, I too will congratulate Dick Taylor and his coyotes. But I want to go a little deeper than that. You know, you can coach kids, boys or girls, and, and they can win. And, but it's what you do in their hearts and in their lives that matters in the long run. I've known Dick Taylor for over 30 years, and instantly he started his career at Peoria High School. Just going to throw that in. Uh, he's one of the kindest men that I've ever known, and he is a builder of young men. He's not just a builder of football players. My oldest son had the privilege of playing freshman baseball under Dick Taylor and still speaks of him as one of his role models. So uh, thank you, Dick, if you're listening to this. I also want to just mention, it, it just shows how humble he is that he did not know how many wins he had 
Uh, he had never counted it up because it's not a matter of trophies or statistics. It's a matter of the boys that he works with. He's, he's just the best. Um, and Frank, I want to congratulate you on your service in that area. Uh, teen depression and suicide is so huge now. And um, anything you can continue to do in that, I applaud that. Uh, we just need to figure out more and more ways to alleviate that pressure from teenagers. Um, Let's see, yes, Walt Richardson, who performed at the uh, MLK event this morning, he's an amazing human being. He's from right in Tempe. I started to say Phoenix, but he's actually uh, got his start, he told me, in Tempe. And he really complimented the city of Peoria. He said, you know, it's time you guys got your due here because uh, you're really, really coming along um, in terms of the things that we provide our citizens uh, in terms of events and so on. So, uh, and yeah, it was, I think, about 400 kids, and they, they just were so in tune to him, and the ones, the 15 fifth grade boys or so, that weren't, were enjoying rolling down the hills in the sunshine, and it was just a great morning. And thank you to PR Unified School District who provided those buses. Every time they take those buses out of the lot, it costs them money, and I, just to appreciate that you saw fit to put that money into something that helps grow those kids, and certainly Dr. King's uh, example is huge for them. Um, yes, the state of the state luncheon was good. It's always good to mix with our peers and to hear what the governor has to say and his plans and to motivate us and see how we can play a part in that. That, that was, it was a good, a good time. Music on the plaza and food trucks, that's just scratching the surface of what we're doing here in Old Town now. Every weekend, you can find something here, and every single day, Driftwood Coffee is open and out the door with people. Uh, young people working on computers. Um, I personally, at my age, could not do like homework with that music, but Anyway, I think you can get those things that put on your ears that you don't have to hear the music. But very, very popular and long, long, many years overdue to have our coffee shop here in Peoria. And for you teeny tiny people out there, uh, tell your moms that I will be reading a Dr. Seuss book tomorrow morning. Hope I can read all those words because uh, they're kind of weird. At Peoria Main Library, 10 a.m. And... Um, it's a far cry from the age group that I taught, but I do like those little munchkins. So that's where I'll be at 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you so much. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Leone? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Just want to say God bless each and every one of you. God bless America. And God bless our great nation. And God bless... New England Patriots. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Youth Council Liaison Gilbertson. Um, thank you, Mayor. I'm nothing at this time. OK. All right, well, I just wanted to say that it's really great to hear about our, our new and renewed partnership with ASU. Um, and our partnership with Huntington University is flourishing. Uh, they have been doing so much digital media arts work within the Valley. Uh, it's tremendous to see their showcase. It was so impressive and so professional. Um, and it was nice to have their board of trustees here because I think it's a sign of their growth and a sign of, of um, their footprint in the city of Peoria. Uh, so we look forward to a long and, and fruitful future with Huntington and ASU. And so with that, we are adjourned.